This is Contractor Sense with Ruth King. Welcome to Contractor Sense. Here you discover ideas, tactics, news, and information that matters to your contracting business and you. I'm your host, Ruth King. This episode is sponsored by Financially Fit Business. Get the business tool that helps you grow profitably, build wealth, and live the life of your dreams in less than 10 minutes a month. Go to www.financiallyfit.business and get started today. Thank you for joining us. Here is how we will help your business and you. My guest, Jonathan Orpin, founded, successfully operated, and sold two eco-friendly companies. The cool part is he sold through an ESOP and currently serves as the CEO of the ESOP. So what does it take to create an ESOP, and how do you get employees to get an owner's attitude rather than a we-just-work-here-and-collect-a-paycheck mentality? What does giving back really mean, and how does it affect operations? Jonathan will answer these questions and more. Welcome to Contractor Sense, Jonathan. Thanks, Ruth. Glad to be here. My pleasure So to have you here. So let's talk about, I mean, you're basically, you took your company and sold it through an ESOP. Why don't we explain to our listeners what an ESOP is first so that they understand what we're talking about just in general as the format of the business? Sure. Uh, an ESOP is an employee stock ownership plan. It's part of the ERISA set of laws that uh, were developed in the 70s and 80s by Congress to to do a number of things. One is it to uh, protect uh, people's pensions from um, not illegal activities by owners or pension holders. And so, uh, but part of it was that it created this ability for an owner to transfer uh, the ownership of his or her company to the employees using this ESOP technique, which is a tax protected entity. Um, The tax protections uh, along with um, the tax savings, along with things like, uh, of course, your earnings and whatever loans you need are what transfers that uh, ownership. So for instance, in this case, I was bought out by the ESOP. The ESOP represents the employees and um, and that was the choice I took instead of, for instance, a third party sale or a, or just a catastrophic failure if I stayed too long and got carried out. <laughs> well, we won't want that to happen. We, we would hope that you'd have some sort of transition plan before you got carried away in a box. Well, people often don't, Ruth. It's interesting. And, and the truth is you need to start that transition plan five to eight years before you actually want to do it in everybody's opinion. And so this is a good time for your people to be listening to this and thinking about it because time travels fast. Yes, it does. Absolutely, it does. So, you know, do ESOPs, I mean, you've got an ESOP where people and team members and they're really into the business because they're now partially owners. When you formed the ESOP, did you see them actually change mentality just because they're now part owners? Well, or was it an education process? Yeah, Ruth, it's a great question. And um, I need to clarify that an ESOP itself is kind of an expensive uh, uh, way to transition. You need to be a certain size to carry those costs. If you are, then it's a great way to transition. If you're not, there are other ownership, actual ownership approaches everything from um, phantom stock to worker owned co-op you know all of those things are worth uh, any of your smaller listener smaller company listeners to consider uh, the truth is though ownership mentality starts long before the actual ownership occurs although the actual ownership is important the shared ownership is important but an ownership mentality is one where your coworkers really believe that you have more than just your own pocketbook in mind. You know, people want to work where they feel comfortable in thinking that they have a future there. And the only way that happens is, you know, if you, the owner or the manager, treat that, treat your coworkers like owners and they believe that you believe that. So there has to be, uh, there has to be a lot more than just uh, uh, suddenly, poof, you know, sharing ownership. It really is a, mentality. So now to answer your question directly, Ruth, the truth is we've long had an ownership mentality in my opinion and in other people's opinion too. So the transition to actual ownership was really just the culmination of a long time effort to 
create a sense of community within our company. And that's done by many, many ways. Uh, profit sharing, communication, communication, and communication. So, yeah. you know, you've really, really got to have people in the know. We've, for instance, been an open book company forever. So people really understand what the earnings are, where we're going, how we're doing. And they then therefore feel a part of that. And, and they can see how their own efforts have either helped or may need to help some more. So, I mean, that's a really fast talking answer to your question, Ruth, but uh, there's a lot to ownership mentalities and true ownership. We didn't see yeah. that immediate change because we'd already been climbing that ladder for so long. So the interesting thing is you mentioned that you've been an open book company and I can just hear or see, you know, visually some of our listeners rolling their eyes in the back of their head saying, I'm never, ever going to open my books up to my employees. Tell me why you think that, I mean, why did you do that? Number one, and how has it helped? Number two. Yeah, we've actually been that way for 20, 25 years. Um, I, I don't understand why somebody wouldn't do it. You know, when you say people might be rolling their eyes, well, uh, I guess I just feel like if that's the case, maybe they have something particularly to hide and, and or they feel... Their that, salaries. Yeah. Well, we don't, you know, we, we are open book on everything other than individual salaries. That's an interesting and subtle point. Um, earnings, projections, costs, uh, job costing. That's all pretty. Uh, uh, that's all pretty open book. Each individual personal uh, uh, personnel's earnings, uh, whether hourly or, um, or or salaried, we do keep that as a personal professional courtesy uh, as a privacy. Yeah, I mean that's that's what they're thinking is that I've got to I've got to tell them what my salary is, and some what you're just saying is no, you don't. You just lump it together. Yeah, you know, and there's ways to address that. Uh, there might be that might be tied into overhead costs in your line of yeah. you share that, for instance, or or office expenses and that sort of a thing. So, so, so it is a cost. Uh, as an owner, you are overhead, generally speaking, unless you're out there swinging a hammer or, or or pulling a wrench all day, and 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 you are overhead. So that is a cost to the company. They have to understand that. They have to understand what Jack Stack once called the great leader yeah. business. Yeah. Uh, and and mm -hmm. in understanding that and in sharing that information and those both struggles, but also wins uh, with your staffing, uh, with your coworkers, then that creates that sense of community that you're asking me about right now, Ruth. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we'll, we'll talk more through this um, after we take a break. But before we take a break, Jonathan, if somebody wants to reach out to you, how do they do that? Uh, so our company is New Energy Works and um, newenergyworks.com. And that's a worthwhile place to look at uh, 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 for a little bit more about us and our culture. Um, for me personally, I'm Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, at newenergyworks.com. So, uh, so easy, and I'm happy to chat with people about it. I'm relatively passionate about these topics. Very good. And we will be right back. Thanks for listening to Contractor Sense. Imagine you had total freedom. You didn't have to worry about money. You didn't have to be a slave to your business. The words, I can't, are eliminated from your vocabulary. What if you could do what you want to do whenever you want to do it? A financially fit business could give you that freedom. How? By knowing what your financial statements are telling you and taking action based on what they say. You can do this in less than 10 minutes a month at an investment of less than taking your family out to dinner once a month. And if your financial statements are a mess, you can get help. Go to www.financiallyfit.business or click on the QR code below to get started today. We're back. Thanks for listening to Contractor Sense. Before the break, Jonathan and I were talking about, Jonathan was talking about being an open book and, and Jack Stack's The Great Game of Business. I mean, if you have not read that book, go read that book because it shows you why you should be an open book company. As, as Jonathan said, you know, we don't share individual 
you know, hourly rates or salaries or something along those lines. But it, it really helps that everybody understands, at least from my perspective, how they impact the bottom line, you know, how they impact the customer experience, how they impact customer revenues, you know, so that they truly understand that they can be having an owner's mentality rather than, oh my gosh, we just work here and collect a paycheck. And and that's where I'd like to go now. I mean, Jonathan, you mentioned before the break that you've been doing this for about 20 years now. And how did you start and what were the challenges that you had to get people from saying, okay, I work here for 40 hours, I make $20 an hour, so my paycheck is you know, $800 less taxes, and I'm just here to collect the paycheck. Yeah, so one one thing that we all have to acknowledge as business people is the, is the stark truth that there are no magic, there's no silver bullets in running a business. I like to say, there's no silver bullets, there's a thousand silver BBs. So, you know, you have to be able to do a thousand things right. And with a lot of your younger staff or people who are just coming in and, and in this more fluid employment atmosphere we have, there's not this, there's no magic here. Suddenly shared ownership or open books isn't gonna suddenly change everything. It's just one more silver BB in the, in the uh, pocketbook there in the pocket. So I just wanna say that I don't think it's a, it's a miracle but it is an important step towards creating community. And a lot of what I think, you know, companies should do more of is create community. And well, how do you create community? Shared vision, shared reasons, and shared resources. Um, and, if you, and if as an owner, there's just a zero lack of interest in sharing those things, then this probably isn't the direction for you. But for most people, they find it to be very rewarding on lots of levels. I mean, let's think about it, Ruth. We spend more time with uh, our coworkers than we often do with our families. We get home and we're tired, and we, you know, watch some TV, eat dinner, and go to bed. <laughs> so, yep. so why wouldn't we want those people that we spend all day with to feel like community? That certainly is my, you know, my directive, my my uh, uh, reason for doing all of this for sure. People say, "Hey, Jo, what do you do for a?" What do you do for a living? I'd say I create community and it's not always easy and it's, and I don't do a perfect job for sure, but it's everything you can do along those lines are actually just really good business decisions in my mind. So I don't know yeah. if that's answering your question exactly, Ruth, but it certainly is important things to think about. Yeah. So when you're looking to hire a new person, you obviously want to test to make sure that they can be part of the community. Is that right? in an ideal world. You know, <laughs> hiring is always a, a tricky thing. So a friend of mine says, every time he hires, he thinks about the person, will this person be his partner, a good partner? You know, and, and, and if not today, will this person grow into being a good partner? You know, and that's that's wonderful. It's not always easy. Uh, in While it's easier this year than it was a couple of years ago, we all know the struggles that we're having in hiring good coworkers. But again, oh, yeah. Every study shows it's not just the dollars, it's also the, uh, the place, it's also the reason, it's also the desire to have a good working environment. There's all these things, all these silver BBs mm -hmm. that it takes to mm -hmm. hire the right person and attract the right person. You know, recruiting and itself, I'll you've got to have a reason for them to come and work for you. And money is yeah. certainly important. Absolutely, it's certainly important. So are benefits. Uh, but the truth is they want, people want more than that at least if they're going to stay. Yeah, I mean, I worked with a guy one time who paid the highest in the entire area, you know, for hourly rates and stuff like that. But he was absolutely miserable to work for. <laughs> and pe people left, even though they w went back to jobs that they were making less, simply because they couldn't stand working for him. Yeah, and there's there's lots of reasons. Maybe he wasn't polite. Maybe he was disrespectful. Maybe he didn't share a vision. You know, whatever those reasons are, you, you just can't do that anymore. No, absolutely not, especially in this day and age. So do you weed out the people who are there just to collect a paycheck or do you coach them or yes. can you turn them around? Yes, yes, and yes. You know, or, and this is interesting, in a, in a shared ownership environment, they get weeded out often. Uh, rather than the guy who's neck working next to you being a 
well, I'll just use the word slug, and nobody really caring or gee, this or thinking, oh, this is one of those companies that allow mediocrity, so I myself will be mediocre. Interestingly, when that person next to you is supposedly a co-owner or uh, or and, and again, whatever, however you define ownership. Yeah. But in an ESOP, you have shares in the company. And if that person next to you is doing not well, then the share value actually will go down because that person is not part of the solution, not part of the benefit. Uh, so we just had a situation just two weeks ago where a long term employee happened to happened to be continually kind of going down in performance. And and to be honest with you, he was uh, imbibing in some illicit something and driving. A vehicle <laughs> okay. and, and one of his coworkers, young coworker came to me and said, I'm sorry, I just can't, you know, this isn't okay. And, yeah. and, and unfortunately that person lost his job and apologized on his way out the door for failing his community. But, you know, would that have happened if the other folks didn't really care? Maybe, maybe not, but it's nice when everybody cares. Yeah, absolutely. So final thoughts about owner's attitudes with your coworkers. You know, I consider it, a, I consider it the right thing to do. Um, we're, we're relatively high ethical business. We believe in the triple bottom line of shared importance of people, planet, as well as profit. Um, but so, so we just believe that's the right way for a business to be run. But it's also just plain good business. And for those people who are looking at transitions, it implies and suggests your business will actually be worth more when you decide to transition out. So however you transition, whoever buys your business or however it's valued at the end, you know, good business decisions are, are what make a good, healthy valuation of your business when it is time to transition. So to me, that sense of ownership and that reality of ownership that goes along with it uh, is all part of just making a good business. Jonathan, thank you so much for being on Contractor Sense with us. We oh, appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. I hope I helped a little bit, Ruth. You did, absolutely. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Choose one thing that you discovered and implement it in your business. These ideas, tactics, and strategies help you make more money, have more free time, and give back. If you like today's program, spread the word. Please review this podcast on any device you're listening to it on. Help a fellow contractor make more money, too. For comments or questions, call me at 770-729-0258 or email Ruth King at hvacchannel.tv. Thanks for listening. Have a great and profitable day.